Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Finance and Audit Standing Committee for Monday, May 8th. Um, we are meeting today on the traditional territory of the Squamish Nation. Um, before I have a motion to adopt the agenda, um, I'd like to propose that we move item 4C to our first item of business. Um, and if that's okay with everyone, I want to put the amended agenda forward. Moved by Patty, seconded by Doug. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. We have minutes to adopt from April 11th, Finance and Audit Standing Committee. Uh, moved by Peter. Seconded by Susan, all those in favor? Opposed, motion carry. Any business arising from those minutes? Seeing none, we will move on to business. So first up in our amended agenda uh, is Ben Kinoshenko, our technical operations manager. And he's brought gifts. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, if I may address the chair, um, the reason I'm here today is just to discuss um, a portion of the presentation we had at the Public Services Standing Committee meeting. Um, and the, this financial sustainability dashboard that we have up on screen, um, the conversation we had was about the information presented for our five-year average capital reinvestment versus replacement value graph um, for our water system, and essentially showing that we were reinvesting 0.5% um, on a five year, of a five year average of our cost to replace the entire water system. And that correlated to a rough, around a 200 year replacement cycle. So that caused me to go back and rerun some numbers and <laughs> try to figure out where the heck I went wrong. Um, so this is, as you all pointed out very well, incorrect. Um, and the reason for that was uh, it's a five-year running average and we only have three years of data. So that dashboard is calculated automatically by the benchmarking initiative for us. And because we only had three years of information in, it gave me an incorrect figure and then I didn't check it before I brought it to this meeting. So our actual reinvestment rate is about an average of 1.1%, which is in line with generally accepted asset management practices um, and puts us at about a 100-year replacement cycle. Are there any questions? Where would that end up then on that graph? <clears throat> is that putting us towards the green or still in the yellow? Um, so green starts at 0.95% investment rate. So yes, into the green and if we look at the median value there of um, so the uh, other 45 municipalities across Canada that, that are participating, it puts us above the median value by half a percent. So in general doing a, a above adequate job compared to the group. Thanks for coming back. Uh, Thank you. So, and I remember this coming up now. Um, but I was under the impression, um, I mean, one of the reasons we're in a replacement mode right now with our water system, for example, I remember this from my first term in council, is they had about a 50-year lifespan, um, the infrastructure, and we're nearing or past, in some cases, perhaps past the end of that lifespan. So even 100 years actually seems a bit long to me. I mean, do we really expect they will last that long? Or is this newer types of pipe and so forth, or? That's a tricky question to answer. Um, part, partially because it's not only pipe um, that is included in these numbers, it's also different assets such as reservoirs and pump stations, and depending on the asset, they have different lifespans. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really a question to be answered through the asset management planning process, I think. <coughs> and again, for our engineering, engineering department. So this is a high level average is what you're saying, versus yes. looking specifically at pipes, Yes. which would, I would expect to have a lower replacement. It depends on the material um, 
and the year it was installed. Generally, when they're doing, when they're looking at asset management, it's when was it installed and what is the material type, and they have different theoretical um, replacement schedules for different types of pipe. So cast iron might, uh, sorry, ductile iron, you might get 80 years, asbestos concrete, you might get 50, PVC, you know, it, it could be longer or shorter, I, I don't have those numbers in front of me. Um, and then it depends on soil conditions as well. So um, ductile iron pipe, for example, in a hot soil would corrode quite quickly. Alright, so I'm trying to understand the value of doing having this number. It seems like it's almost too high level to really useful to us in terms of decision making. I'm just I'm trying to understand what the value of knowing this number and evaluating this particular number. Is there? Usefulness? Um, it gives us a barometer of what we are contributing to replacement and where we um, factor into the best management practices set by other communities across Canada. Whether that's valuable to us specifically, um, I think is up for debate. This is one of how many measures in this whole benchmark system though. Depending on the module we're participating in, um, 600 and some. You want to follow I can see it being valuable if you're actually comparing apples to apples. You know, this is for pipe, this is for reservoirs. But when it's all mixed in together and really everybody's system is so different, I'm not, I'm not sure how... I just don't want to be distracted by a number that might not actually be giving us a good barometer of anything if it's almost too high level. Well, I think from that very high strategic level, what it's suggesting is that even at 100, as uh, Councillor Race has noted, even at 100 years, we might not be quite where we need to be on an aggregate level. Agreed that to really get down into it, reinvestment levels does need us to look at more individual components and then aggregate that. But at a, but at a very high level, what this is suggesting is that we're higher than the average, but you know what, we might not quite be high enough and again, we can factor that into our into our long-term financial models if, if we think that we need to sort of increase that from 1.13 up to... It give, we can also set targets with this and see then if that's getting that, turning that dial to where we want to be. So from that, I think it's a, a broad planning tool. I think for a detailed planning tool, we've got to break this thing down into, into its component parts. And just for that, I think that was... The worry I'm trying to express is that it looks like we're doing a bit better than average, so it's like, oh, well, that's just fine. But I, too, it's like 100 years. <laughs> we're planning to, re to replace every 100 years. We're, we're going to miss the mark. So I just don't want us to be distracted by numbers that <coughs> may not be providing the value we need them to provide. And I think our concern was 200 years was way out of where it should be. 100 years is much closer. Um, but, and I think what it's saying is we, we may still not quite be there, but we're a lot better off than the sort of alarmist information I gave you a few weeks ago. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Susan and then Doug. Thanks. Um, you know, I wasn't really as concerned about our water system until I dug into <coughs> the yard and tied into a wooden shelf so <laughs> in the downtown because you know, I really am concerned that there's a lot of areas that are reinvigorating and that we're looking at infrastructure, but our basic infrastructure, you know, when I tied my brand new sewer pipes into a wooden pipe and thought, I don't know how many wooden pipes are in the ground. I don't know the distribution of asbestos versus, like even for the supply, because when we were taking apart our taps in the downtown, um, even at the clinic, we have white asbestos filings that happened and we've had to put filters on. And I, you know, I looked at the data and it's not really a health concern, but it is a concern for water distribution, is how much asbestos pipes we have in the ground um, that aren't in areas of high redevelopment, that we're not gonna be digging up the streets anytime soon. So how are we going to access 
re, a renewal of that infrastructure if we're constantly waiting for roads and paved over the top consistently. Um, as well, I'll just add one more thing is that we talk about water distribution talking or uh, starting at where we collect the water. I still have concerns, and I brought this up before, about our natural assets. We rely on glacier-fed water distribution, and we have a receding glacier, and it could be there for 5,000 years, it could be there for 100 years, but with climate concerns, it is receding, and we know that it's receding because we've been taking pictures of it receding, and we don't know how fast that recession is. And if it is our water supply, there are other, it's not a problem, there's other aquifers that are large within our district, but they're being, now they're being permitted to other people when we should be looking at that, at those different distribution systems as possibly a future water system. So I don't think, I think we just accept the natural asset because it comes into our house when we turn the water, but we don't look at the infrastructure as starting at the natural asset. We look at it at the distribution center. So I would like to understand our natural assets a little bit better and know that we have enough water to feed a growing population for the rest of our, and that we're putting appropriate amounts of money and savings into understanding that distribution system starting at the water distribution center, which is glacier fed or aquifer fed. So can we start with the first question around how we um, determine how much of each type of pipe is in the ground and what's, what's the strategy when it's one is in an area of low development potential? Sorry for the chair. I'm, we're, we're developing as, as time goes on. Our, as, our understanding of the assets in the ground is, is doing nothing but grow. Sometimes it's a matter of um, we don't have ours built, so when we dig it up, we find out what we have. Um, anything that's less than 20 years old is probably pretty well known. Um, the rest of it is reasonably well known. Some of the very old stuff is we know what it's there. We know it's there, but we may not know exactly how it is built or what condition it's in. So I think from an asset, sort of an inventory point of view, I think we have a fairly good, from an asset management, the water master plan, um, from my reading and from my discussion with Mr. Ralston, is <clears throat> he's fairly confident that that's, that's a fairly good, robust look at where we need to be in terms of um, replacement and new infrastructure. Um, with respect to the, the future of our water supply, um, again the water master plan was um, as reasonably as it can, is it, it doesn't have a, there isn't a huge concern that, um, that there's a substantial risk there given that the, um, the amount of precipitation falling in the basin isn't, in te isn't um, understood to be changing substantially. It might be falling in different, it might not be snow, it might be more rain that will reach and recharge the aquifer. So from that point of view, it wasn't, the predictions aren't, aren't that we're moving into a substantial drying period and there's substantially less precipitation. It's gonna come at different times and in different forms. So from that point of view, I don't think there's a, a serious concern in the next 100 years that, that our water supply is under threat. I just want to save the discussion about natural assets for another meeting because it's fine, it's not a committee. I'm just doing this little yeah. update here to bring an update the information so we we'll keep on talking. Yeah. Did you have a follow-up? No, I, I, this is a finance, not a committee meeting, and um, natural assets is an important discussion. But not it's not on this agenda. Yes. Did you have a follow-up question? No, I'm fine with that. Thank you. Um, and I think uh, Gary related is sort of where I was going with my comment because I'm focused on, well, I guess, one of 600 indicators, but, but uh, for me the value of these is to guide future decision making, future budget decisions are one of the values of it. And so focusing on the water system as, as an example of that, um, I, what I would hope that this would do, that plus um, the asset management plan, would say that at the present rate, uh, maybe we're the same as the Canadian average. Everything I read about the Canadian average is that it's way below par, uh, and everybody's in an infrastructure deficit, so we don't necessarily want to tie ourselves to that. But it would guide uh, decisions in future budget meetings about are we replacing enough each year? <coughs> um, and 
and the benchmarking would help us determine that. So to me, that's the value of this. And, and so, you know, a hundred years, I mean, that's just my, I'm not the engineer, but common sense tells me that that's a long period of time. And like anything else, as it has been pointed out, you know, it's like amortization values. There's different for all kinds of different classes. You can break that down all kinds of different ways. But I think that's what we want to kind of do with this stuff, is get to a point on, on I'll just focus on the water pipes for a minute. Uh, we want to know that if this stuff has a, has a life expectancy of 75 years, then it doesn't make any sense to have an amortization period or a, uh, an investment period of 100 years. So I think we want to kind of tie the two together for these various classes. That, to me, is the value of this. And, uh, and so I'll leave that with you. But I think if we're going to go forward with this, then I think we do have to tie it <coughs> to these different assets. And if we see that there is a deficiency, then I would hope that it would come back to the budget process uh, and staff would bring back a proposal to perhaps spend more on water by each year than we are presently. Just as an example. Okay. So just a couple of comments on this topic in general. Um, first, uh, Mr. Tim is here, or Mr. Tim, wrong man, <laughs> Mr. Kinshenko is um, essentially working with a uh, province-wide metric, province-wide, Canadian-wide, um, sort of standardized reporting. Yeah. But absolutely in-house, we consider things on a granular basis. We do struggle with the various tools we have, but we do have asset management plans, we do have water master plans. Um, the last asset management plan ten generally guides us in terms of the level of investment we need to make annually. And uh, we are looking to update that asset management plan in the future. Down in the TTP horizon of four years, we are looking at a full cycle asset management system. And the, the key behind that is that finance has their system right now of you know, how we kind of do the financial statements. Uh, engineering uses GIS those two systems would be synergized in a few more years so that we could truly do proper life cycling, which is, I think, what everyone is expecting and what we are anticipating doing. And until then, engineering and finance work pretty closely to try and find that happy balance in the interim. Great. Thank you. So we're moving forward. Awesome. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, I just have one more thing, too, Ben. It's actually um, interesting that you're talking about natural assets, but this is our latest and greatest from our water conservation area, it's two steps. You get a frisbee, you put it on the lawn with the frisbee's full, you don't need to water your lawn anymore. So, if everyone would like to have one. Yes. Yeah. 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 That was, uh, yeah. 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 Thank you. That's my, uh, Good job. Right. Anybody else? That's really cool. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks, guys. Yeah, I better get another one. Yeah, I got too many. They'll be killing each other. Two kids. They're not pussy. Oh, they are pussy. Well, they're pretty much too, right? They're. They fly around. They're pretty much too. Thanks, guys. They're actually a bird feeder as well. As long as it's up high and it's not a bear attack. Yeah. Um, okay, we're going back to um, 4 1, and this is our um, budget process review. So, everything you experienced during this year's budget process, whether good, bad, um, or neutral, this is our opportunity to provide that feedback to staff so that we can continuously improve with our budgeting process, um, which of course will start all over again. It hasn't already. <laughs> <laughs> Ow. 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 All right, so I will hand it over to you, Christine. Thank you. I'll just uh, be right with you. Come on. Maybe? Do you have it on this side? Not yet. I've got it here, but it's not coming over there, so just bear with me here. Is there a trick to this? Yeah, you have to put the keystrokes that tell it to the left. I've done that. I've done M5, and it went there, but now it's coming back. Did that. So I'm going to do it. I won't extend. I won't oh, tap, just give a quick tap, Sarah, to the um, 
laptop button. Just quick so tap. Just hold on. Oh, Sorry. Bear with me. Try it again, quick tap. <laughs> Let me try again and open it and see if it'll come. Oh, did you shut it off? No, it's not. Well, it, now it won't even go with the F5, so it's better with me here, because that's what it's supposed to kick it into the slideshow. Oh, do you want to kick it in? No. Oh. Maybe we'll just take it through all our little... Take a five-minute break. Yeah, let's take a five-minute recess. Don't while we wait for this. Usually it goes pretty See, it's here. It's just not Sarah, can going you there. Shut room off. Room off. Press it down. You have to hold it down until it goes. And then reboot that system, and then we should. I don't want to lose it here. Now <laughs> no, it's just changing. Got it here. Okay, we're back um, in the Finance and Audit Standing Committee from May 8th. Um, okay, so now we're going to be talking about the budget process review after fixing a little technical difficulty there. Um, and again, this is our opportunity to provide some feedback. So Christine, we've got some notes, um, and then we'll open up uh, the table for discussion. Thank you, Chair Elliott, Christine Matthews, Chief Financial Officer with the District, and today we are here to talk about two topics, but we'll start out with the uh, Financial Plan Council debrief from 2017, while well, it's still fresh in everybody's mind, painfully fresh, I'm sure. Uh, so today our goals are just to provide some feedback to inform some of the future financial planning processes, that's what we're hoping to get from Council today. Um, I will, as um, Chair Elliott indicated, I will go through and, s and throw a few things on the table to help stimulate some thoughts and some reminder reminders about things that will hopefully help uh, spur on some of that discussion. And then um, through that, we also probably need to talk a little bit about how the context for 2018 might be a little bit different for us from a resource and capacity specific uh, viewpoint, just to help guide in terms of what that process may or may not be able to be for 2018. So just a reminder that in theory our planning cycle is that uh, we obviously are heavily driven by our council strategic plans, so we generally like that to go first. Uh, we also use master plans, so those are the asset management plans, water master plans, uh, liquid waste management plans, various plans uh, around the organization. Uh, we use those uh, to feed in and then of course we have operational and regulatory requirements that we always have to feed into the budget planning process. Uh, those from the Council Strategic Plan, we feed all of that information into the Management Action Plans. And we use the public input that we've heard through the year on all of those various aspects to help guide the preparation of the action plans. And in, in a great world, a perfect world, that would all funnel down and then guide our financial plan. The problem is when you get down to the financial plan, we sometimes run into some of those financial constraints and we have to lobby, you know, bounce back and forth between the two and come to something that's reasonable and that we can balance those various aspects. Uh, in 2017, we started the business case, uh, business casing new initiatives, which is part of our guiding principles. Uh, Council only saw it in tidbits uh, for the 2017 financial planning process. Again, our guiding principles are that we would have all larger projects requiring a business case. And what we're doing is basically applying that to anything new. So where we have master plans, liquid waste management plans, and other um, well thought out uh, documentation as to why we would go for a UV disinfection plant versus some other type of sewer infrastructure. We don't redo that with a business case and we, we believe the business case has been done and that the plan has been adopted. However, if new initiatives come up and they're of a significant dollar value, we do 
uh, look at those and go, you know what, we need to business case that. Does that make sense? Does it look, um, does it make financial sense? Does it make social sustainability sense? These are aspects that obviously don't fit into the pure financial modeling for uh, business casing that you might see in other places, but those things are taken into consideration. This year we did actually make a standardized template for the organization. Uh, it's mixed reviews. It's uh, hard to sort of structure every project into them, but we are uh, moving towards that. Um, just a reminder too that not only do our guiding principles uh, suggest that, but also our audit rec management recommendations are that we apply business casing. Uh, where again we can really um, benefit from having our strategic uh, planning sessions out front is that if uh, emerging issues come from the council table, we also have time to potentially business case those before they come to you, come forward to you in a in a budget scenario. If those come to us during the budget process, that's very difficult. We don't usually have the time and the, and the um, resources and, and the information necessarily to properly ground truth those and make sure that they also make sense. Just a reminder to council about some of the, the schedule that you um, would have seen. There's lots of stuff going in behind the scenes in the background. Uh, but th last year, you started your strategic planning sessions in February and March. Um, in July, we started the internal budget development. By July uh, 26, uh, 2016, we had brought that back out to council just to confirm what the process would look like and uh, ensure that it was meeting council's uh, needs and requirements. In September, we came out and did an action plan review, and um, we also talked a bit more about some of the strategic plan and how we might approach public engagement. In October, we talked again about a little more about the public engagement piece and whether there was any key things that council wanted to go out and specifically ask about. Um, we would really love to see that public engagement piece push back more towards the strategic planning area so that it can feed the management action plans in an ideal scenario from a, a staff feedback perspective. Um, the SLRD submissions came in October. By November, uh, we were in front of council with the utilities, which was great because we were able to set utility rates. This was the first year that we didn't have a five-year plan as to what the utility rate step up would be next. So it was great to get in front of council and get some decisions made about utility fees. So that schedule worked out quite well. Um, by December, we were out to council with the general fund budgets. And then um, worked, carried on working through that through January on both general fund and any tweaking of the utilities. And by January uh, 31st, we were at a public meeting with um, broader, with a, a basic plan. There were some post-meeting adjustments by, and at this point we were still very much on our budget that we had originally put out in July for council's consideration. Um, in February, we did some um, second thought. We had some really um, volatile assessment rates and uh, that had everybody a little bit concerned, rightfully, that there could be a fairly big influence on budget. And so we sort of basically slowed down the process at that point and waited until we had some property tax uh, numbers for the revised role. And consequently, we were able to get the financial plan adoption on April the 18th, and on May 2nd, we did the tax bylaw adoption. Essentially, uh, what the schedule, it takes staff about four months to prepare budgets. And uh, based on 2017, it took us approximately another four for the council workshops and, and the final adoption of the bylaw. Going into 2018, we have uh, a little bit of a wild card that we're not used to having to try and also juggle at the same time. So again, the TTP factor, I'll call it. Um, we do have major uh, computer system implementations underway, and the first uh, couple phases of this project heavily impact financial uh, resources, obviously. So, um, although we're really excited, the future view is amazing, <laughs> the climb up to that and, the, and getting there is going to be a fairly stringent uh, test of the finance department. And we essentially only have a select number of senior staff who can run all of these major projects. So when we get into um, budget, generally right now is starting in July and ends about April 2018. 
We have a year-end audit December. That's another major project. Our manager of operations usually runs that for us, and that runs from December through to April. On top of that, in 2018, we are going to also be trying to go live on Business World Financials, scheduled to go live November 15th, and will have significant implications on the corporation as a whole in terms of rolling out um, aspects of new chart of accounts, um, reporting, etc. So that's a very tight, that's bumping up very closely to our year end at this point. Uh, on top of that, we will be in, in the major implementation mode for payroll and time sheeting, which is supposed to go live in January. And actually, we're talking now that it'll go, we're hoping it'll go live by the first payout in the first week of February. So when you see this schedule pictorially, you'll actually see this bumping into February. Uh, on top of that, we're basically, in order to take Maze out, which is our past provider, and put the new system in, we also need to replace all of our cash management interfaces. So that's where we get into a lot of our municipal modules. That will be our taxes, property taxes, our utilities, our licensing, permits, and ticketing. Um, and on top of that, we're going to be trying to roll back just from the building permitting stage. We're going to try and start into our next phase of the TTP, which is development. Again, although you'll see with the municipal modules that that impacts other departments, bylaw, um, building department, um, just, uh, and finance pretty he the most heavily, also animal control. Um, realistically, they have a very, very heavy financial interface as well, and so we will need senior team leads on those as well. And development as well with the building permitting. So, um, just to give you a pictorial, because that's sometimes easier to see, these, these are kind of the bars, and you can see there's quite a bit of layering for us through December to uh, April. And the reason I'm sharing this with Council is that we, we pride ourselves on being able to spend a lot of time with you in budget and to work through those things. But as you can see, our time frame for that is going to be really, really challenged. And where we struggle the most, frankly, is, is um, reproducing materials for workshops and trying to get things um, clean and perfect for public distribution. And that takes a fair amount of our resources. We essentially now have um, a, manager, or a financial analyst dedicated to budget for about 0.92 FTE of a year, um, just to run that machine. And that doesn't, that's irrespective of all of the resources that we have around the building, because budgeting is a corporate-wide initiative, so a lot of our senior management team is also tied in, tied up very heavily through that process. So for 2018, it's also going to be Council's last budget term on Council. And although nothing's really changed for this Council, I think you've always been very focused on achieving strategic priorities. We've always had a really close eye on ensuring financial stability for the future. And definitely, we're always weighing up and trying to balance all of that against affordability for the taxpayer. The reality is, for 2018, though, um, it's going to seem even more critical and more scrutinized than ever before. So we're going to have to be balancing all of that. Uh, for 2017, just to recap on some of the financial sustainability issues um, that we were trying to achieve, we wanted to do 1% to reserve contribution increase. We ended up removing that, and again, trying to balance affordability and make sure that our tax rates were in things. We were up to already 1 million annual contribution to capital. We'll talk about that sort of a little more in the next segment in terms of how we're sitting in that regard. But we ended up removing that um, to try and make sure that our affordability targets were met. We um, increased, we had planned to increase the direct contribution to capital when we started out in July. Those sort of some of the key things we would have tried to do. Um, the target was to go up another 250000 We achieved about $60,000 of that in terms of increasing our direct contribution to capital. In terms of threshold for borrowing, uh, we were trying to meet a minimum of three hundred k before we went to borrowing. Uh, we did pretty well on that. We just about made it. Uh, we ended up bundling about three fire projects in the 11th hour, again balancing that affordability question, and took those to short-term borrowing. Capital funding envelope, um, so the actual amount that we contribute, um, just to talk about borrowing, uh, borrowing for the general fund was estimated to be about 1.88. We ended up going with about 2.9 million, um, and that includes the 1.4 million for Newport, which is sometimes a bit difficult for us to um, 
you know, with this SODC or SODC lands or the oceanfront lands, it's going to be a little bit difficult in the next little while to stay truly on our year over year because there are going to be a few more spikes in our borrowing requirements as we go through. The major one is the roads project that's <coughs> underway right now and it's being phased out now, so we'll see that hitting us less substantially in the future. Um, with the utilities, um, the new borrowing is 2.5 million. With the community works fund, we had um, targeted to do about 600,000. We did about $751,000 worth of community works draw to make the capital plan work. And from the equipment reserves, we had budgeted to do about a million and we came in at about a million too. So, um, sorry, the black figures are the capital funding targets we had given out to the departments and the red numbers are what we actually got through budget. So, making some sense? Yeah, um, I'm just thinking of the short-term versus long-term borrowing and the interest rate considerations and how all of that when we go over what we expect to borrow and we end up paying interest on the amount. I know we have a fantastic interest rate, but how does that factor into our budgeting as well and get us to the threshold faster because of the interest on borrowing? So our interest rates are very favorable right now for sure and although we budget to borrow realistically we end up not achieving the entire capital plan. So our borrowings I think are staying within our, our capital funding targets year over year. We're, we're, we're doing well there and again in the next segment or the next item I will talk to you more about how are we doing with borrowing, how are we doing with reserves and accumulate surplus so I'd love to revisit that Thank if you. that's okay Thank you. at that point. And then the special project envelope was another target we'd put out there. And again, I'll talk about this a little bit more in the next segment um, in terms of how are we doing financially. But we had targeted, um, over the last couple of years, management has essentially targeted about a $650,000 envelope. Um, and again, I'll talk to you about that, uh, the trends in that uh, further on in the agenda today. But essentially, this year we made uh, about $486,000 of direct taxation funded um, projects. Okay. And one of the reasons that's a target is that every year we do have special projects. They change, they might come and go, but essentially we're trying to stabilize the tax rate as per our guiding principles. And so we're trying to ensure that we have at least a set level of project envelope or project fi funding available year to year so that we're not spiking up and down every year with a different special project. Okay, question from Patty. It's more of a, a bit of a comment we have, when we have visuals like this. I'm wondering if... Um, what we, what we, because sometimes the target, if you're under the target, it's actually better than mm -hmm. if you're over the target. I wonder if we could do like a green, yellow, red. Like if we, sure. we didn't hit the target, it's red. If we did hit the target, it's green. If we're, you know, we did well but came close, maybe yellow, just so we can look up there and see where, see it right away. where it's yep. a positive target that we have or not. Because just looking at it, it's hard for people to understand if was it a target that we wanted to exceed that number or come in under that number. Right. It's, it's just no, it's great. It's great feedback. I will, I will take that away for sure. We're pretty much over on all of them. But it's over good. Right, right, right. Oh, I see. That, that's a question that Patty's asking. And for communication, for the community, just community as well, as I understand. Because sometimes a target is we want to get there or above it, and sometimes a target is we want to keep below that target. Mm -hmm. But at a quick glance, and if you're not, if you don't know budgets really well, it's hard to understand if we. It is achieved our targets. It's more of a communication tool than anything that I was talking about. No, I think that's a very fair comment. I'll take that away for sure. I think um, to um, Councillor Pryor, Pryor's uh, comment, um, in theory, all of these essentially are below our targets or, or we didn't quite make our targets this year in terms of financial sustainability. I'm going to talk to you later about I don't know that we're not doing well in the bigger picture. Otherwise, I probably would have fought you more at the table here. <laughs> because I think overall in the four years you'll see that we are making some good progress in our in our capital and our financial sustainability. So so we um, although they were we, we might have taken a bit of a step back in some of these areas this year or not progressed forward the way we had anticipated or put our lofty financial goals out front, um, I still think that we're we're doing well overall. So and uh, just to clarify to the boring utilities, I wasn't very clear when I went through this area. We had put 5.5 million in there because we understood we were going to need to do a major solid waste project. That would normally not be the target for our borrowing, um, but uh, we thought that we would need to do the, 
the vertical landfill expansion, so we tried to provide enough envelope for the department to, to viably do that, and recognizing that it would probably be an unusual spike in our borrowing uh, hit. And in fact, we are phasing that out more, more over five years than what we did when we put the funding envelopes out. Um, so just getting the ball rolling here, so it's just some thought processes to kick out for you. Um, in terms of length of process, if uh, council wants to think about uh, how that's going for them, if, if it's making sense. Uh, length and timing of the workshop, so do you, did you like, we tried to set aside sort of a full day for workshopping and, and you know, dedicate it to the day. Um, is it too long, too short? What's, you know, how's council feeling about that type of thing as we go into 2018? We'll try and guide that uh, accordingly. Um, whether the materials provided were useful to you, or helpful, um, whether there's things we can do differently to make that more effective. Um, effective ways to stay on our targets, some of our financial targets, are there, are there um, key ideas that council would like to bring to the table of how we can help you do that better and again that comes back to the key things are we meeting the strategic focus are we staying financially sustainable in the longer term and are we re remaining in an affordability target for our, our um, rate payers um, how is council feeling about budgeting without the revised role so we've pushed everything earlier in the year to try and achieve a financial plan earlier in the process um, there's a lot of good arguments for why we need to do that but when the chips were down you know, are we really comfortable with that? Because taxes do matter. And so is there, um, w what is the balance? Where do we weigh out coming in early and spending that time going back and forth versus going maybe later in the process when we have those rates or do we go earlier? That will bring up other questions because of course we don't like to prevent too many delays in year one. We have problems with tendering and borrowing when, if we do that too robustly. So is council maybe committed to putting a more robust, if we are gonna go later, then maybe we put a more robust focus on year two of the budgeting so that when we come into the next year we still have a financial plan in place um, that we can operate and get some of our key tenders off of. I think in this um, place too, I really need to revisit with council the concept of early release. Um, there is no legal mechanism for early release. Essentially, if you don't have it in last year's financial plan, early release can be essentially illegal. Um, like any other item that council does, if it's required to be done by a bylaw, it is still required to be done by a bylaw. So, so um, we try to, to be reasonable about that because we recognize that there are some things we just want to make sure is going to be in the next plan. When we do our budgets, we try to do them very high level. Um, we try to make sure that we give management and council some opportunity to respond like any other business would have to, to the things that are going on on a regular basis that we might not have known whole holistically when we did that budget a year and a half ago. But essentially, there is not really a, a, a true early release thing. If it's a new initiative that we didn't contemplate in 2016 for 2017, for instance, then technically we're on the wrong side of that. So um, I just want to caution us to t think about that too as we're deciding what is the right timing for our budgets, where are we comfortable. Um, and just a reminder under the community charter, so that's 173 says that we are required to have all expenditures in a financial plan and all the funding sources for that are required to be reflected in our financial plan. And under section 191, a council member who votes for a bylaw resolution, resolution authorizing expenditure, investment or other use of money contrary to this act or the local government act is actually personally liable. And your out is that you rely on us to tell you that, and that's why I'm here telling you that. So, <laughs> gonna rip that carpet out from under you. <laughs> Make sure I'm telling you that we need to be cautious with that. So hopefully we'll never bring you something for early release that you can't say early release, which is usually goes through me, and I look at it and I go, okay, do I have a bylaw that would support that? Might we have to plug and play or take something out? But does the bylaw framework essentially support us asking council to support this ahead of time or not? So those are some of the things that I'd like you to consider as we decide timing and things that, um, and, and also ramping up and getting, not, not effectively taking a full quarter out of our year before we can start key initiatives that might be time sensitive. Um, and finally, what are your expectations around business case? Are we meeting those in terms of going after the new initiatives and, and higher dollar values, or are there things you'd like to see business case more and more robustly? Um, 
Also, in terms of length of budget, how long is our memory, our collective memory? We do a lot of this work up front. Uh, in the early workshops, we talk to you around capital targets, financial sustainability targets, things along that line. Five months later, I don't know about you, but my mind's not crystal clear on that stuff anymore. <laughs> I'm sure it can't be for you with all the things that you're barraged with. So the longer that process goes, sometimes the harder it is for us to remain with our priorities and really focusing on the things that we set, set out to do. So, um, so with all that in mind, I'd love to touch base with Council and sort of throw it over to you and tell you or ask you what you'd like to do. And I'd also like to just share with you from a staff perspective of what we thought went really well. Um, and so I can do that first or second or whichever you prefer. But um, I've got a question from Ted. Okay. Well, a little bit ago you were mentioning our process starting earlier, just finished up on. And I know I've been in, I guess, five budgets. <clears throat> and it seems like I supported starting it early, like we were going to do an early, get at it earlier so that we could finish earlier. And I, did I kind of hear in your conversation there that you thought maybe we shouldn't be starting too much earlier? Is that what I got out of that? I mean, I, I thought I heard, oh, oh, you didn't really like us starting too much earlier. So through the chair, I actually prefer you going earlier, but it is a, it is a trade-off. Yeah. Because if you're going to go earlier, I'd also prefer you pass the financial plan in February, which is yeah. what we had originally targeted. I, and, but respecting that once we try to get our ratios established in, in terms of tax distribution, and once we're comfortable that your financial plan essentially fits within the targets of a revenue increase, beyond that, unless council is very serious about reducing that after the fact, or have some set ideas of where we're going to reduce that after the fact, there is very there is a good argument to do the financial plan early and wait for the tax rates. There is a lot of things we're able to kick off and do and, and organize, um, get the tenders out, get the borrowing up and running. So. And, and just get our crews out there and, and get on, get in, get her done. Is that not it? Yeah, I just, I just didn't quite understand. Mm -hmm. I got it yeah. right. But I do, I do respect. It was very difficult. The assessments this year were very volatile, and there's, I think, realistically, they will be again for a little while. So I, I certainly sympathize with having to balance that. Uh, we've been under a very different or unique situation recently. So, council. Um, Christine asked, do we want to hear what staff think went well, or do you guys want to weigh in about what you think went well first? I don't know. Doesn't matter. Okay. So from, uh, from our perspective, we were pretty, um, pretty excited that we actually, in, in, from the CFO perspective, because I'm kind of watching how the organization's operating, I was really excited about really seeing that step down. We actually started at the strategic plan. It did drive action plans for us internally, and we did form a financial plan with those things absolutely in mind. I thought we did that the best I've seen in the years that I've been here this year. So I was really pleased with that. I thought we had really strong management support for vetting the budget and making sure that it came to you as, with some really thoughtful processes behind it. So again, I was really pleased with that. Um, I was excited that we actually had the introduce, introduction of a standardized business case in case that, we, you know, instead of everyone kind of doing their little thing on the side based on their project, we actually uh, rolled out a standardized business template. It's not perfect by any stretch, but hopefully it brings enough elements that you're, you're actually able to look at a project and see the same elements coming through depending on whether it's a service level change or a, or a special project or capital project. So I thought that went well. I was um, very happy to see that the utility budgets went in, fees were set, and essentially um, council stuck to those utility budgets. And until we threw you a wild card in the 11th hour, I thought the utility budgets were pretty, um, pretty well sussed out, very, very much so, um, pretty well by the time we went to the public in January. So I was really happy about that. Um, and that allowed us to pass the fees before the start of 2017, which there's um, competing thoughts on whether that, but generally we don't like to set fees retroactively. Uh, the law doesn't really allow us in most other circumstances, and because we have monthly rate payers, we really value getting those utility fees out by December 31st. So again, those are th some key things I thought went really, really well. 
Um, just personally, I felt like the council gave us a lot of energy and a lot of um, thoughtful process and, and uh, really thought through the strategic plan and how that connected with the budget really, really well. So those are some of the things I saw. I don't know if any of the other management team wants to comment, but I really found those things to be done extremely well this year. Yeah, probably. And, you know, just from my perspective, I agree with everything that Christine says, but I really want to emphasize that having a strong uh, council strategic plan in place helped us when we were prioritizing. There was very little disagreement about um, what was being put forward uh, because we had the strategic plan and those um, initiatives already in there um, to tie projects back to. Um, I think that it really it, it helped us to line things up and add things up. So that was it was good. Uh, Gary and Jeff, any other comments? I don't think I can add to it. It was my first time through the process and I thought it uh, moved fairly smoothly again from that strategic perspective to then, you know, hearing the feedback from council and you know, we ended up with a good result. Using it as an evaluation tool. And you survived. And I survived <laughs> on that. Come here. Still here. <laughs> okay, Christine, shall I open up? Please. Go to the can you come back to the page before you want to out outline? So I want to dig down on this um, early release of funds thing, mm -hmm. because particularly on some capital, big capital things, um, the odd hire, I think, we, I think we did too many hires early this year, um, but the odd hire for a real strategic priority. Mm -hmm. But I want to do it within the context of uh, the legislation that governs it. So how can we make sure that we're, can, can we pass a five-year financial plan in January and then uh, should it need amending, you know, release funds legitimately through, mm -hmm. should it need amending in April, we can go back and amend it in April, is that the best process? That is definitely a way to go. Um, there are other organizations that do provisional budgets, um, so um, I'd rather call it the budget and amend it if we need to because why go back and do another one if you don't have to? <laughs> so probably, I think February is probably realistic given Christmas and when things are coming off. The other thing that um, sometimes causes some toughness for us is if a council's in transition, so we're, one council's going out and one's coming in, we generally need till about February to really get the new council in, get them back up to speed, and get a bylaw through. 2019 will be, yes, yeah. um, tip tough. But absolutely, I mean, if we really hit the wall and something dangerous came through that we are like, no, we definitely have to go back in and amend. We can amend. The legislation does allow us to do that. I kind of felt this year that we got, uh, every couple meetings we would have a request for early release of funds. Mm -hmm. Some of them were driven by the strategic plan, some of them were driven by internal mm -hmm. personnel or whatever the issue. So I, I just kind of felt like we were, it was like yeah, almost used too much this year. Mm -hmm. And um, so I want to make sure we're doing it legitimately. So if we can maybe aim to do a, I mean, we can call it the final budget, but basically the first draft of the budget, approve it, mm -hmm. um, clearly articulate with council which ones, instead of just coming in, oh, can we do this one early, can we do this one early? Say, you know, these are the five things that we want to get underway, these three capital projects and these two very strategic mm -hmm. um, personnel positions, and not sort of come in with the, oh yeah, by the way, can we do this too? Because I kind of felt like we did that this year. Yes, I think there was there's truth to that, that uh, we, we kind of asked the departments to hold back and wait and not bring you early releases because we were still on schedule and we looked like we were going to have it by February and that's pretty reasonable. I think um, most municipalities would envy that delivery date, frankly. Um, we got hiccups because of the role. Because of the role, yeah. There was some definitely strange things going on in the role this year. There's no doubt about it. I, I mean, I'm, I'm not sitting here passing judgment on this one. I honestly can understand where council's concern was this year. But year over year, I would prefer we pass one in February. If something radically changes and you need to go back and amend, then we go back and pull a project out and amend it. I think that makes more sense, frankly. Thank you. Yeah, just on that point, um, because there are, in my mind, there's 
there's several different types of things that would justify early release and, and um, contracting and the bid, bidding and the construction because that's seasonal uh, and and us making a decision is just the start of a tendering process, etc. So I mean, the shovel doesn't hit the ground the next day. So so those things make absolute sense to me to be able to facilitate that. Uh, and it's almost probably more than not uh, with construction uh, and tendering projects that you would want to get that started as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. So uh, so if we had to go back and amend, we had to go back and amend. Uh, generally speaking, I'm looking at that list of things. Um, I was uh, generally quite happy with it. I, I, um, I understand the issue with the role, uh, but to wait until we had the role uh, would really put us behind the eight ball into the spring and sort of defeat a lot of the things we're trying to accomplish. So I think it's inevitable that we're going to be starting without the final role uh, and hopefully get, in this year, I know it was kind of quirky, but looking back on what we had to change, I mean, it was less, I think, than 1%, just going by memory. I mean, it was a relatively small thing. It kind of causes a little bit of last minute grief, but it was a relatively small thing in the overall context of the budget. So I, I don't think we have a choice except to start early. Uh, otherwise, we start this thing off in February or something, and holy smokes, I go for that. The challenge I had uh, for myself was starting the thing off with <clears throat> business as usual, coming in at something like a, a going by memory again, about a 4.6 or 4.8 percent tax increase. And for the last couple Revenue of years, increase. They were? Revenue, Revenue yes. increase. Revenue increase. Yeah, but. For the last couple of years, uh, we've had this notional thought of 5% as being kind of what we're prepared to uh, put onto the taxpayer. And so, right off the bat almost, we were almost underwater right away. And I don't know the solution to that. I know last term, uh, we went to staff and we said, bring us back uh, an initial budget with a 0% increase, mm -hmm. uh, which I know created a lot of work, um, and, and we're part of that. And uh, and it's difficult to do and required a lot of decision making. I don't know that we want to get to that point every year, but to have more options, I think right off the bat would have been helpful for me. And so I'm kind of thinking out loud, but if you come in with that kind of business as usual budget, or here it is uh, with the inflationary increases built into it and so forth, and give us in addition some options for cutting back a couple of percent, mm -hmm. Uh, because then it makes it more difficult. If you don't do that, then it's, it's really difficult from my perspective to, to go into and consider um, strategic plan, new initiatives, etc. the things that we're kind of personally invested in. Um, so that was my only, coming out of that process, that was the only thing that I thought, gee, that was sort of, sort of the wrong place to start the discussion off from. Mm -hmm. And if I may just comment on that, um, and I'm going back a long way in my memory too, so bear with me. But I believe the 4.6% is a little bit misleading in itself too because the debt service from last year gets rolled in. So that right out of the gates usually puts you another 1% up, right? Right out of the gates. There's nothing we can really change there or do differently to make that different. And of course, we're always impacted by the labor contracting, which, as you know, has an inflationary component to it. Having said that, though, there were other things that we did end up trying to roll back or, or take off the table for you. One of them was that we had incorporated a lot of these targets right in, so the 650 special project envelope and those types of things. We had already tried to sort of feed that concept into that. So even though it's, you know, it's maybe not the total bare bones existing, so we can bring it probably a little more broken up for you as to where that bare bones level is may be helpful. But out of the gates, it's really tough to get around the fact that, you know, 45% of our budget is labor, of our operating budgets are labor, and if they go up 1 or 2%, that's looking at about half a percent right under the gates. And then our borrowing um, very quickly goes to 1%. Just if you, if we were to go with, I think we talked about about a $4 million level last year of borrowing, right under, you're, you know you're going in with 1% next year above because debt service isn't has to roll out. So there are some challenges for us and I think if from my perspective and I, I think probably from management's perspective, if we had some concepts or some conversations around where you might be prepared to have existing service levels dropped in the strategic priority session, that might help guide us to bring you a more balanced idea too. Because we're often grappling with 
we, we talked about all the things we want to achieve and where we want to go next, but we don't usually talk about where might you want us to review our services in a more robust way. And again, really looking to the other managers to draw to pipe up if they have some other concepts or ideas around that. But, but speaking to Council Grace's options, bringing those options. Just to follow up on that, and, and, and it might be helpful, actually I hadn't thought about that as part of a strategic planning session, but that might be a good idea because I hate as a counselor, um, and even though I've not gone through a whole bunch of budgets, I've had this difficulty each year um, making cuts without knowing all the ripple effect of them. Uh, and that's why we went back to staff to bring in the zero budget. Presumably they would cut something and understand the effect of that rather than us trying to wing it in a council table in the middle of a public, public uh, budget discussion. So so it might be good to have that. That's a, that's a good idea because key to that, in my mind, is getting a handle on the ripple effect of some of these things. And some things you can cut and there's no impact, but other things, as you know, sort of go through the organization. So we have to understand that. I think if I... Oh. I'm just mindful of time because we have the conference mm -hmm. to have after this and we've got, everybody wants to see. So, My only other comment would be that we are in a period of growth, and so although 5% may seem really robust, normally for revenue tax, revenue increase, realities are we are dealing with capacity increases, like with actual service level, or service increases without service level increases, <laughs> you know, we are actually having to do more with the same amount of staff. So, you know, a key focus of the TTP program isn't that we're going to necessarily reduce staff, it's that we're going to try and deal with growth and capacity issues by being more efficient and doing other things. So we're trying to roll those things out. We went and did the, you know, the exercise of taking back. We've done those a couple times. It, we always are looking at that. Um, is there something that maybe we should go back and ground truth? But we are, it, we are running up against a wall in terms of trying to make it work for the, the increased volume well, of service. <laughs> I think Council's strategic planning session is a place to have those conversations. It's our last budget and what are our priorities for this last budget and you know, um, what, where do we want to invest in our final budget and where would we you know, step back a bit. Um, so I've got Susan and Ted down here. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm not, I did not like going to the zero budget because I felt like that put extra strain on staff that's already pushed to the brink with uh, the amount of growth in the community and that I, I do feel the struggle of staff with our strategic plan and that we have robust growth in this community. We don't we yet have an OCP to work with. So most of our decisions have been made outside of OCP decisions and community input which for me is where I thought, I thought staff did an amazing job of bringing us everything we asked for. Everything that we, you know, if we had a notion about something, staff literally brought it the next meeting with financial preparedness and, uh, and the numbers that we, made, we needed to make good decisions. Um, so I really appreciated that aspect, but I struggled to work outside of public input Again, on a regular basis, I feel like we've passed a lot of uh, like we've passed a lot of uh, notions, like the IAP two concept, and yet I really haven't felt in the last year that we've had a ton of public input. Even though it's been offered to the public, it's not necessarily that it's not out there for the public, but for whatever reason, we did not have robust public engagement. We literally had a few people dribbling in for the budget. We went out a lot. I think staff did a really robust job, but for whatever reason, we haven't had participatory access to our budget. Please have a suggestion. I suggested every single year that we invest in software that we do, and we didn't again this year. We didn't get it out there. Where we had a lot of discussions about it, but it still didn't go out to the public in that. Uh, and I know that Christina Moore was looking at again, and it's been years of looking at something to get it out to the public where you have sliding dials or something that's interactive where people can see the budget and dial back where they feel as opposed to us looking at it from the outside and saying, you know, maybe we can dial back here. But uh, I think it's really relatively been 
I, really, I liked starting early. I liked all the information that staff gave. I thought the financials were really robust and well done. And uh, I think that there were some decisions that council made that, you know, as in every single budget that I didn't necessarily didn't agree with, but mostly because uh, uh, scrambling and operating outside financial information that I required to make decisions. So, uh, like the actual true cost of things, what's coming in and what's going out. The in and out are the two things that I need to know. And we didn't have the in, so we couldn't really, we were guessing on the out. We waited a really long time for the ratio analysis. And so I really, that took a long time too, so. So one of the things that Christine mentioned was possibly moving up the uh, public engagement piece just after our strategic planning session. So rather than it coming after staff have already presented the first budget round, it's trying to pull it up so that, and we're doing our strategic planning a little bit later, but I think to build on your comments, that actually would be helpful that we are engaging the public. Certainly I would support that um, idea. It's moving the engagement with the public earlier just after our strategic planning. That makes sense to me. May I just comment to, um, we, we have some tools. Sandra did some great tool work. She, we had some things drafted up that were available to roll out. <coughs> when the smoke clears, we have to know what questions we want to ask people. And you know, what, what are we looking for and what are we prepared to action when they feed back? So we need Council's help on this. We really do. Out of the strategic sessions, we need to understand what are those burning questions you need to know from the public. You know what? What do we need answered before we can build these budgets? So, yes, I, I would like to see that earlier. I would also like to see some key questions coming out of the council area in terms of areas you'd like us to focus on for public engagement. Thank you. Thanks, Ted. Yeah, I agree, with Sue. You've got to watch that in and out stuff. And uh, I, I do like that zero percent. Staff trying to bring that zero percent in. I, that's a good exercise because uh, I guess I've been here five, better five years. We've been five to seven percent increase every year. And now I see a lot of new buildings and we've got a lot of more income coming in. So I think this is a zero percent exercise would be good. Well, I don't think Doug said that. I, I, for, just for clarity, Ted, Doug said to bring in just the the rises that we have to do because of inflation yeah, and and then provide more options from there. So I Doug <laughs> didn't mention a zero percent budget. I don't think Well I like I like that exercise. Whether we follow it or not, I do like trying to keep everything at bay. And you know, this is gonna be about one more budget after this one, like I say, which I kinda that amuses me too here and that. Um, and so uh, the strategic planning, perfect. I welcome the conversation about budget items in our strategic planning. So. And if I can just comment on the zero percent concept, remembering zero percent being the revenue increase requirement, right? So um, when we have growth, that could mean that taxes go down. Nothing wrong with that in the big theory of things, except that you don't want them to go down one year so that they can go up 10% the year after. And that's what we did see uh, several years ago when we did do an actual true 0%. The reserves were hit. Uh, the, next, the next years after, we saw a significant increase. So most theories are that it is better to stabilize and increase your rates over a term, progressively small, you know, increments every single year. So I'm just going to leave that. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, Peter. And I appreciate that comment because I think that's one of the key pieces is try to, if you try to drive it down to that zero percent of the rebound effect coming back again to, to sort of counter for that. And I appreciate your comment about um, the presets and dealing with contracts and labor and, and those other issues because those are, those dictate a lot of what we have to deal with in the, in the taxes. Um, and I, and from Doug's point of view, the, the ripple effect I think was a big one for me last year when we had the binder had all the information in because that really provided a, a deep insight into what that ripple effect is you know just one one small item here can go through the entire organization um, and i think having provided all that last year 
really helped this year uh, to see and understand what those effects were. And I think you guys did a great job this year to work the process. I do agree, though, um, starting earlier uh, without the role is a bit of a challenge. But I think filtering it through that later on when we get there, it's, um, it's expeditious. I think it needs to be done. It's, it's a bit of a guesswork here, but uh, I think the juggling paid off at the end. And um, I think this is probably, the, out of all the budgets we've done, the smoothest one for me. Honey, do you have any more comments? Maybe. Um, I, for me, um, I like doing it early. I think that um, I like the workshop format because I like tackling the things in large chunks on specific topics, like working through the utilities and then moving on to capital and then moving on to general. Because I agree, the longer we um, moved away from those conversations, it was harder to go back and go, why did we make that decision again? And then we didn't have the staff in the room that could answer the questions that we asked. So we end up sort of repeating ourselves. So I do like that workshop format, setting aside the time. Um, I think for me, um, it would be great to bring the business case template um, to this committee uh, so that we can look at it. Because we didn't actually see it until it was all filled out. And I, I think there might be some improvements we could make to it. Okay. Certainly, I think we're still struggling with um, how we grapple with return on investment, especially when it requires a service level increase, or um, it's, you know, how many years did we really wrestle with that sidewalk machine? <laughs> it's a huge capital cost, but we couldn't sort of figure out if it was more staffing or less staffing or more capacity or less. So um, certainly for myself, I'd love to see that template uh, um, so we, get, we can keep it around before we get to the budget. Sure. And, and I agree, I, I like Doug's idea of sort of having a, a business as usual, sort of all the increases we have to do, mm -hmm. and then having some options, mm -hmm. um, which I think should come out of our strategic planning process, about where we want to focus, what our strategic objectives for this year, um, where we can ask staff questions about, well, what if we spend a little less here, what would happen, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but overall, I thought it went well, and certainly would like to finished earlier than we um, I think we're good there. No, that's great. Thank you. Um, right. Obviously, and I, hope, I think we've probably heard some of this already, but if there's any other thoughts around what we could do better um, that you haven't voiced already? Yeah. Let them know. Let us know. Um, and so the next conversation on our agenda is around the surplus and reserve review, and this came up during budgeting. Thank you, Doug. Um, <laughs> but just understanding what is actually there, um, what, how we're funding um, reserves, how we can use surplus, what are, what are the things we would use it for, wouldn't use it for, um, what is a healthy surplus, um, that sort of thing. So I'll hand it over to you for that next conversation. Sounds great. Okay. Um, I just as I leave this one, are there any other things you'd like to see us bring forward into 2018 that we maybe didn't talk about, or are you as we go in for the pieces? Okay, sounds great. All right, so surplus and uh, reserves review, and I threw in a little bit of borrowing in there too, just to give you a rough idea of where you're at, because often how we choose to use our reserves is tied in. So one of the key things, obviously, we do have our long-range or long-term financial planning guiding principles and policies. We did talk about that last year. We got some great feedback from Council. Our goal is to envelope that into proper financial policies. Please bear with us. I think the timeline showed you that we're going to be really um, struggling this year to produce some of those things we'd like to do uh, while we try and deal with the TTP project. So, but it's definitely on our horizon and when we can get staff back up to our, with our senior people back in place, uh, we have every intention of formalizing those more. Uh, from the capital expenditure uh, guiding principles, the only reason I'm bringing up this one is that it does touch on some of the reserve information and things that you want to keep in mind as we look at where we're at. Um, Basically, the, some of the guiding principles are to replace existing assets based on condition, not theoretical lifespan, which we do. Fund ongoing rehabilitation and replacement out of current revenue under a defined threshold and the rest out of a combination of reserves, revenue, and debt. So that defined threshold right now is 300000 um, although we do go to reserves under that where it's applicable, um, like the equipment reserve, for instance. 
We fund new assets through revenue and reserves and larger projects through a combination of, of revenue, reserves, and debt. And that growth pays for itself and only front ender agreements where there's a specific advantage to the community should be contemplated. So just going to very quickly start off with debt and the guiding principles there. Um, again, that $300,000 threshold, so we're not trying to take a bunch of small things to small debt. There's, uh, we end up paying quite a bit more in interest and it's uh, administratively difficult to manage those. Um, so there's not a lot of, in terms of efficiency and effectiveness, I think 300000 is a, a minimum level and we've hit that target. Uh, we did talk to council before about that one million, and I think there wasn't a huge buy-in to necessarily go to the one million level. So we can, you know, I, I don't think three hundred thousand is work is non-workable for us. I think staying at that short term right now is, is doable. Maintain a debt servicing ratio that allows borrowing room for emergencies. Um, so target debt at service level twenty or at um, twenty percent of revenue of uh, stable revenues, not all revenues. So right now, where are we at with our borrowing authority? We're at about 14%. So remember, our target's 20% and legal is 25%. We're at 14% of our debt service um, as a ratio to the um, revenue, the stabilized revenue. So that's where we currently sit. It's just under 14. The estimated total borrowing remaining based on our targets then would be about 62 million under 25% and, and 32 million under 20%. Uh, the key to um, this metric is that we have very low interest rates right now, so this assumes today's interest rates and an amortization uh, period of about 15 years here because I'm sort of ramping it back from 20 years down to 15 and that's where I'd like to take our financial policies is that we're not going to debt for 20 years for most things. It would have to be an, an extraordinary instance. Just on this interest rate issue, um, they're low now. Are these locked in rates? For the duration of uh, on a particular project, if we borrow a million dollars at one and a half or two percent or something, whatever it is, um, is it locked in for the 15 years, or is it reviewed periodically? Or so I guess my question is, are we exposed to an interest rate increase? So with most things longer than 10 years, yes, we're exposed. So MFA will only take any debenture for 10 years. They just refinance it in the 10th year for us if we're on a 15 or 20 year amortization. So there is a risk. That's one of the arguments for why I'm trying to bring us down to a 15 year beyond the fact that you can almost double your cost with interest if you don't get your amortization periods down. So I, again, I think there's an argument to really try and keep your borrowing levels at 15 or lower. And you'll see when we actually bring debt issues to you, you very rarely have ever seen me bring you an, an actual debt issue for longer than 15 years. And hence why I think from, from a loan authorization perspective, we're even starting to gauge our loan authorizations too, so that we are, you know, are being realistic about where we're going to go with that borrowing level. So the estimated capacity when I look, when I do the sort of work, groundwork around what could we do realistically over the next 20 years and stay within a nice, stay within our 20% targets. And I think that magic number is about $8 million of borrowing a year. So with the debt coming off and going on, I think $8 million is sort of the max you, we want to take per year, just for Council's uh, understanding. And in 2017, our new borrowing was $5.4 million, so we were within that target. 2018 estimated impact of borrowing debt service on taxation is 1.1% right out of the gates. Realistically, we don't, we probably won't borrow everything we are set up budgeted to borrow because generally our capital expenditures don't meet that level and so we may not go to borrowing. One of the things, however, is um, we are relying very much right now on our accumulated surpluses to interim finance, and um, I would like to move away from that. It is causing us some complications as we get to surplus, where we're really understanding where our surplus position truly is when we're interim financing and using it as an interim capital financing mechanism. So we are going to start going to the more municipal norm of doing some interim financing for each capital project. And we're, we're doing a lot of work internally around cleaning up how we deal with debt, so please bear with us. But um, the idea is to get to a more standardized approach where we take a borrowing for a major capital project and we take it to full construction or we take it to construction financing until we go to debt and then we take the whole project to debt once and for all. So that's basically our goal right now around debt and borrowing. Does everybody catch that? Make some sense or 
Um, solid waste, significant uh, es uh, increase, estimated at about 8.7% impact on the fees. Um, and that is just the initial kick out. So the initial borrowing we're doing on is what we'll call phase one of the vertical expansion. It does not include the stuff right now. So, but we're expecting that that's going to have a fairly significant impact on the fees. So just to keep those things in mind. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just okay. Um, and just, just a metric on the solid waste, sorry, I will just say that um, right now we're at about $90,000 worth of debt service. By 2021, we're forecasting to be at $870,000 worth of debt service. So it's significant. And, and solid waste is really the, the one fund I'm, I'm fairly concerned about in terms, we need, to, we need to look at it more robustly, we need to be more realistic about fees and making sure that we're, we're taking care of that. And or we need to build up the reserves for the future. Um, reserves guiding principles, again, just to go back, uh, establish an emergency reserve for unexpected events, uh, establish and maintain working capital with an annual target of about one-eighth of annual operating expenses. I'm not really sure where this metric comes from, so we can talk about this some more in a moment. Um, build capital reserves to fund future infrastructure rehabilitation as outlined in asset management plans. So, um, what reserves do we have? Everybody wanted to know. So this, these are the reserves we have. These are council designated reserves. That means we have an official bylaw on the street for them. And we hold the reserves based on those bylaws and we can expend them based on those bylaws. Um, as you can see, the equipment reserves stayed relatively stable over your term. Um, so coming out of 2013, it was at 5 million and going into 2016, it's still at 5 million. It's, it's actually a very functional reserve. I know we've had some discussions about the bylaw and I did approach Whistler and talk to them about their equipment reserves. They actually uh, we're impressed with ours and asked me to send ours. So, um, <laughs> so, you know, I think it is relatively a, a, a stable, solid reserve that seems to be doing what it's supposed to do. The rehab and replacement reserves, the uh, council's made about $4 million left in their term. So I think that's really important. And it's um, a key area that I was concerned about when I first came in was that the general fund where all of your diking, all of your roads, all of your really expensive infrastructure outside of water and sewer, obviously, um, had no reserves. And so we have over that uh, six year period, we are now sitting at at least uh, 8.5 million between all of the funds and utilities. And I'll break that down more in a moment for you so you can see. Do you have a question now or do you want to go through all the reserves? You can go through all the reserves. Okay. Um, gas tax reserve, that's community works fund reserves. So that's, uh, those have been increasing over the last few years. We get about $776,000 a year now. And, um, and we flush those into reserve and we use those predominantly for capital, but they, it's also a great reserve to use for major studies like liquid waste management plans, water master plans that generally aren't that easy to find grants for. So. Affordable housing reserve, so um, that has uh, gone up fairly substantially in the last year. We've all effectively taken it down to zero with the center point project, um, but it's uh, working its way back up with our community amenity contributions. Uh, carbon neutral reserves is the um, carbon, um, when we do our carbon reporting at the end of the year, they give us a credit back and we put that credit in this reserve and we use it for um, basically carbon reducing initiatives in the community. Uh, the legacy reserve, I, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, to, we, there's a few here that we probably, there are little amounts left over so we probably need to resolve what's happening with those. I thought we'd distributed all of those so I'll just have to touch base with our legislative services and see what, if there is any residual left to pull from here or not or if we're done. And then the sinking fund surplus. So this is essentially uh, we hold sinking funds on all of the debt that we go to um, through with MFA and those sinking funds ultimately at the end of the debenture period pay off the debt. So we're constantly paying in and then there's actuarial and everything contributing. So we actually don't just pay off our borrowing like a mortgage every year. We actually put it in a sinking fund, a reserve. And sometimes over time, those reserves exceed what we need to pay back. And then we get, MFA sends us that when they pay off the debt. And we put it in this reserve. And it's intended to pay down future debt and or to um, be used for another capital purpose. So. so those are all the council designated reserves that are open for council use and discretion within the parameters of the bylaws that you have created. Um, so the re I just want to go to Susan's question. Yeah, I'm 
wondering about the carbon neutral reserve and why, if, if it's possible, that we can change it to a carbon adaptation reserve. Mitigation is not something that we're really, you know, it's, it's, it's a good thought and it's a, you, but, you know, like in, I just think of the 4% contribution for our entire country. And if Squamish really has a place in mitigation when we can barely adapt, and we don't have money set aside for adaptation, we haven't finished the work with Quest University, and none of that's come back. And I wonder what we are doing with adaptation versus mitigation. I think that's an entire conversation that needs to happen, and I'd like to see that conversation be evidence-based and not just politically minded. So uh, I would like to see that come back in the conversation. Uh, so it could be that some of the reserves hold funds that we can use for adaptation, right? Like decking is an adaptation. We can do anything happening. that mitigates our carbon footprint under the outline of the reserve. Yeah. So do you have an issue with the name or what the reserve can be used for? Uh, I'm not sure what the reserve can be used for, if it's just mitigation or if it can be used for things like uh, like we took out a lot of, like, I don't know if we took them out, but the shelter, the uh, um, emergency shelters that were going to be placed around the community with uh, shovels and bags and first aid supplies, you know, those things seem to get pushed out of our budget. I'm wondering if this reserve is something that could be used for that sort of emergency mitigation or uh, emergency adaptation. So Christine, maybe you could just um, provide some detail. I see Patty, I'm just going to ask Christine to talk about that carbon neutral reserve. So the carbon neutral reserve is a council of bylaws, so in question of whether you can change it, yes, you can, you can, we can amend that bylaw. Um, the bylaw itself right now is basically fairly open-ended and allows us to do anything that would mitigate uh, the community's carbon imprint. Yeah. Um, or footprint. Um, I think what you are talking about might be a bit of a stretch based on the language right now in terms of adapting for weather control patterns or things like that and having an emergency service. We would generally look to a different and I would probably guide you more towards our protective services area if you wanted to do some stuff around there. Exactly. So I'd like to have that conversation with the reserves. Sure. This is not place for it. So. But, uh, in the future, I'd like to have that conversation. Okay. Thanks. Honey. Well, this was set up in my first term, and it was set up to specifically um, meet the targets as was coming out with the provincial guidelines on the, every municipality has to be carbon neutral. So the number that we put into reserve area is generated by our actual carbon output as an organization. So that's what this is for. If you want to set up another reserve, we have a dozen of them that can be used for adaptation or mitigation. How do we measure Carbon neutral? It's there is always an organization. Well, hold on. And, well, this is how it's measured. This is what the reserve set up for. And we've been holding it in reserve and not spending it necessarily that, I can't remember how much a year. It's about, we, we 30, feed it about 22 or 30 in that yeah, summer. It's, and that's basically $30 a ton for the, for the output of our operations. We got a little bit of an offset because we did some improvements at the landfill, even though we don't take the landfill. So this is very specifically to, to meet the provincial We've signed on to the Climate Action Charter. This is specifically to meet that. We haven't been spending that X amount buying offsets but because we want to spend that local. So ideally, we create the carbon neutral, as we've said through the carbon neutral reserve, uh, the carbon action, the provincial thing we signed on to, that we start using those monies to go back into the local carbon marketplace to help actually stimulate some economic development that does reduce carbon. This reserve fund was specifically made to make us operationally carbon neutral. We want to create other reserves to specifically target um, uh, adaptation, and we can do it through all these other ones. I don't think we have to actually set up another reserve. But that's what it, that's what it was for, and it's based on our carbon effort. It's very simple. I, I think at some point, the district has to start looking at all of its planning in terms of climate adaptation. You know, will we have to spend more on eggs sooner than we thought? Well, you know, is our infrastructure built to handle more rainfall coming all at once versus over the course of, you know, once a month? So, you know, 6% more. It, it's, 
that's not the conversation for today. But I think, like Patty said, I think a lot of what we are doing is captured in some of these reserves. We just haven't specifically called that. Mm -hmm. And again, we do, in behind the scenes, we do have staff that work on finding out what is that base neutral level, and, and that's part of that reporting that we do annually. I think we have to realize, if I may, it, it's not a lot of money that we're putting in there every year. It's not, no, no, we're not going to change the world. It's, it's to get us to carbon neutral from an operational standpoint. Okay, and then the rehab and replacement reserves are specifically broken down by fund, and this is where you'll see quite a marked change in the general fund. Um, it was, it's going slowly. We kind of went up 1% per year, so we started out putting in about 200000 a year. We were up to a million now. Which, so over the next few years, we'll start to see this grow exponentially now with that level. So I think that that's uh, kudos again to this council for stick, keeping that in their, on their radar as we've been budgeting over the last few years. Um, the water, we've been, essentially we've had to cheat a little bit with the borrowing into the water. We had kind of asked the water and sewer utilities to step back and stay away from borrowing for a bit while we got the general fund reserves up. We've had a hands-off <coughs> approach to our general reserves for the last few years. And I was trying to get that into a kind of an equilibrium, equilibrium of basically two million going into that reserve every year in direct contribution and two million of direct contribution into capital expenditures. I felt when we got to that kind of four million magic number of capital investment that we would probably hit a nice homostasis position where we could start drawing from that reserve in and out and, and be fairly comfortable for the next few years. Um, the water, we have um, had to go into it a little bit more robustly with the water master plan. We have started to do some of the initiatives in there and that's been um, putting some extra emphasis. The sewer, uh, definitely we have robust reserves there. We continue to contribute to them. So this will be a conversation that we'll have with engineering in terms of you know, what's coming up that we need to continue to stockpile here um, and just see what's realistic. And then solid waste is an area where we're basically not doing any capital funding from reserve right now. Uh, we are totally going a borrowing route and have been. Um, so that's, again, something that council can consider a bit more. Although I think you're going to be impacted pretty heavily now by the borrowing approach. And it may be unrealistic to get too um, ambitious with the reserve build as well. Okay. So on something like this, and, and let me just take as an example uh, the sewer. Um, at what point, or what is the tipping point for the next project being funded from reserves versus borrowing or the combination? Is there some formula or policy we're applying? So thank you through the chair. We've already reached that tipping point a couple of years ago. We actually do no borrowing from sewer right now. It is 100% finance from reserve and our uh, operating revenues every year. And some of the other ones, for example, Water, we're, we're borrowing 500000 on new initiatives. So the only borrowing you're seeing in water and sewer are for past projects that are continuing to move to come through. But a couple of years ago, we stopped financing any of the sewer um, by borrowing at all. And the uh, water, we're borrowing uh, 500000 for water mains right now just because its reserve was starting to falter a little bit and we needed to inject some borrowing back into the... So you said it was about the four million dollars for a general fund. Oh, for general fund. Yes. That is the for everyone. Sewer is healthy. So, I'm going back to the long-term financial plan, which I don't remember in detail, but I know that one of the things coming out of that was building up the reserves, um, and we've been trying to do that, and that's put a lot more capital um, directly from taxation into our budgets. So I think it might be helpful, at least for me, if. Um, if we had sort of a report of where staff think the reserves should be versus where they are. Um, Come in there. That, that <laughs> <laughs> I'll stop. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's move on then. I will get there. <laughs> but yes, I think that is healthy. And, and to, to answer your question, we really made the utilities be self-funding over the last few years. But we did have borrowing in stream were set up for past projects, and we're still borrowing a little bit for those. But anything new, hands off, except for the 500000 in water that we are contributing towards the water um, mains, the major million dollar per year water mains. Okay? And that's, again, we consider that to be a short term until we can kick over and start using the general reserves, and then we can start balancing off again, getting back to some other borrowing principles. Really hard to read, really hard to understand, so here I'll just cut to the chase. 
this is the best I can do right now in terms of giving you a, one of these about where your reserves might need to be and how you're doing, okay? Or what your contribution to reserve needs to be. So essentially what I do is I take the financial statements, I take all of our assets on there, I take all of the amortization against them and I get a rough idea of what their theoretical estimated life remaining would be. And then I look at kind of the general amortization periods for those uh, categories. You're just looking at the general fund right now. Um, some of these are probably a little robust, probably need to be shorter than they show here, um, but we're trying to be reasonable. And to be honest, we're not going to fund in reserve 100% of all of our replacement value. That's probably not a realistic scenario. So what we're trying to do is get an estimated idea, so with the remaining life based on those amortization periods, what is the sort of pool's remaining life? Um, we come up with that kind of remaining years, and then we break that down and go, okay, so roughly based on book value, not replacement value, so this, again, understates our real need, which we will hopefully get with asset management and life cycling, we'll get a true picture of this. But right now, our, our kind of eyeball is that we have, um, basically we need to make an estimated annual investment in the general fund by all different reserve sources of about 5.1 million bucks to be annually sustainable. However, we didn't get there right away, <laughs> so we probably have a little bit of a shortfall from years that we weren't contributing in. And so the next number shows you what would be the expected investment to date. So we would expect to have about $66 million. Now this is where I put the caveat on because you're not going to hold a reserve for the entire replacement value of your assets. That probably is not realistic. Some of those things need to be borrowed. Some of those things, you know, we're, we're not going to turn over the whole thing. So this is just a kind of an ideal guideline around what is that deficit that uh, uh, Councillor Race talked to earlier today. What, what's kind of considered to be the, where we don't necessarily have enough money sitting? And how does that break down in terms of annual need to catch back up? And that would be closer to $8.2 million a year that we would need to invest to catch up that backlog of stuff we haven't been putting towards. So again, I'm not necessarily representing that we should be putting $8 million away uh, towards capital and direct financing. Again, I think there's a blend between borrowing and reserve, and we, we won't get into all those policies today, but there is a blend, and we don't need to get 100% there. But I do think it's realistic to try and get up to about that $5 million mark. Um, and when I, when I say that, it's not just the, I, I'm kind of targeting for us to get $4 million on the general rehab reserve, and then we supplement that with the community works fund draw and use. And, and um, we're contributing every year to community works funds, so that makes up some of the extra million that we're not at with five. And we also contribute about 300,000 in equipment reserves uh, per year, three to 400,000. Actually, it's closer to almost six this year um, because we've had more new equipment turnover and there's a bigger the way that's graduated down. So I think we're about $600,000 contribution coming in from equipment <laughs> reserves as, as indicated there. Um, and then the, com um, the general capital reserves, we're doing about a million dollars right now. And then we put directly into capital 1.5 million, roughly. Okay. So if I could get those two upper numbers to about two and two, I would say we are super solid, financially solid. All right, Susan, we're technical. It's, I am wondering with buildings reserve and what we do to put away for replacement of buildings, we only maintain buildings. We have never really, as far as I've been on council, really had a fund that we are like this putting significant funds for the growth of our assets yes. away. So I think that's a fair comment. Um, and in building up the general fund, we are essentially looking at all aspects, just like the water, the sewer plant would be in the sewers and the water plants would be in the water we would consider the operating general funds to be in this fund. Um, is it going to be robust enough to replace and is that really factored in here when we probably have zero life values on most of our buildings yes. in this now? <laughs> is probably reasonable to assume that this understates our real overall replacement need. Um, but again, we're trying to work with the tools we have right now and come up with something logical. Um, we we can ground truth this back to some of the asset management plans and facility plans we have. And from time to time, as we do certain long range projects, we do kind of look at that and go, what is that? You know, how are we sitting in that regard? Patty? Just clarify the 1.5 million capital we fund through general revenue. Does that include the paving budget? The which, sorry? The paving budget? 
Uh, yes. So 800,000 paid in budget and 700 some odd uh, other. Okay. Um, next question. You haven't talked, I don't believe you talked about the real estate reserve. So the land sale reserve land was reserve. back here, and we basically, remember one of the principles was that we have um, an emergency reserve? reserve. Oh, sorry, it's coming. Okay, okay. sorry. I, I, I think a little bit of the land sale reserve is, is facility replacement reserve. It can be. I just, just hadn't seen it, so I wasn't sure what the numbers were. You're right. I, I threw these I'm slides in between in the middle, but I will talk about No, we have to hold on to our assets. Right yeah. And I didn't, I didn't indicate all of the reserves yet, because I'm going to come around. I'm sorry, I shoved these in because I thought you might want to know how you're doing in terms of the ones you control and have your, yeah. All right. So, Christine, so just to check in, mm -hmm. we've got like 17 more minutes. Okay. How many more slides do you have? I think I can make it. <laughs> I'll talk really, really fast. Because I know the TPP is on there as a standing item. Yes, I, it's a very good question. Okay. Okay. Um, and it's, yeah. Um, the, this is the same exercise for utilities. The utilities actually indicate that we're doing okay. So we're, we're in the reserve neighborhood. I think that realistically when we asset manage, replace, read life cycle, we'll find out that these are a little low, um, realistically. Uh, but right now, it looks like we're contributing sufficiently on an annual basis to those reserves. In one way or another, we're either direct financing capital or we're funding reserve. So we also have some other reserves. These are legally prescribed, and uh, under the community charter, we are required to hold these reserves when funds of a certain nature come in. DCC reserves, so you have about $16.6 .6 million worth of DCC reserves. Uh, Off-street parking reserve. Uh, now, that was uh, instigated under a really old bylaw, well, not really old, <laughs> I'm going to date myself on this one, 1990. <laughs> um, frankly, I was, still, I was in the industry by then. Um, <laughs> but the, under the, it was passed under the Municipal Act, and so right now it only allows us to basically do infrastructure for parking. Under the current legislation, we actually would also be able to do things with active transportation. So, so council could consider a bylaw amendment on this and rethink whether you want to do other things with that parking lot reserve, so I'll just throw that on the table. The land sale reserve that uh, Mayor Heinzman was asking about, that uh, is your $8 million. We do generally hold that in the back of our minds as being our emergency uh, capital area, so if when, when the general funds weren't here, if we hit an emergency area, but yes, it's all based around a capital purpose. Under the legislation, we have to use it for a capital purpose. And or, and, and or we can purchase municipal lands. And then parkland reserves, and this has got a few things uh, consolidated in there. There was also some uh, quarter trail mem memorandum of understanding included in this line right now. Um, and so that's sitting at about 841, so those are under the Local Government Act, we're required to take parkland uh, contributions when we don't, aren't contributed with parkland, and so this reserve holds those funds and it has to be used for parkland and recreation. Parkland acquisition, yes. So not thank playgrounds. Yeah, not playgrounds, right. that's right. Yes, thank you. We can do park improvements. <laughs> In case you got all excited about uh, yeah. 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 And, and again, legally prescribed, so we have to review and make sure that we're on the right, right side of that. Um, so then we also have our accumulated surpluses and our <laughs> designated <laughs> surpluses. <laughs> 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 no more money. <laughs> no more cookies. Um, and I, I very loosely say that because obviously these are these are internally designated. There, there's no real magic to them. Um, although we try as much as possible when we collect things for a certain purpose to to you know maintain some of that. But but I wouldn't want us to get so tied into we don't do this for every department, et cetera. We have some very specified purposes for these. So the airport, for instance, any revenues the airport generates. We, um, we sort of try to offset any expenses that we generate for the airport and any revenues to come and put that into a set place so that we, we are um, being true to how those revenues were brought forth. The, which the forestry building, um, I think everybody understands. That's the, um, <clears throat> again, the same idea, the forestry building with the, with the ins and the outs of their rent versus their costs and, their, and to debt service, because we actually had a debt on the forestry building. 
The community amenities uh, provisions, um, so those are directly from our uh, developers. Um, and they are, we have some designated purposes for those um, within that, so some have been collected for very specific purposes. This does not include the affordable housing, which we divert directly to the affordable housing reserve, so under your new, or under your existing um, CAC policy. The public art uh, basically started just more recently, so that was 15,000 in year one and 29, about 29,000 in year two. And the current year, we'll wait to see what the public art committee decides to contribute to this reserve when the smoke clears on the 50,000 that we've put out into, into the budget for their designation and use. Uh, the spirit committee I had to do a little research on. <laughs> um, it was formed in 2009, and I know, I, I suspect it no longer has a purpose, but I'm open ears to anybody who knows how we can use that. <laughs> it was, um, came about in 2009, and what I've seen expenses against it so far are more along the lines of um, economic adver uh, development advertising, it's sort of some of the draws I've seen on it in the last few years. Beyond that, I would say it probably could be either consolidated back out to surplus or I don't know how it was. We, we'll have to do some more investigation on that. Um, yeah, to talk as well. I, I think it's, it had to do with the Olympics and trying to, to yeah. leverage some of the Olympic stuff. I'm wondering if we um, uh, just put it into some sort of Canada 150 something this year. Okay. Well, we, we'd have to do it in How 20. Manifests, yeah. The tough part is we'd have to do it in 2018 because source and use of funds are required in your financial plan. So we didn't, uh, we didn't jump on this one for the 2017, so it's something to consider for the 2018. So these are things that might stimulate some thought as to how we might use some of these funds in the 2018. The protective services, um, this one has been accumulated can, over can, many... Can we just go back to that? Mm -hmm. what, yeah. um, we, can, we can use it if it's connected to what the intent of the fund is. For Legally, but we're still required when we draw from any of our um, reserves, piggy banks, reserves, safety, whatever, to have it in the financial plan. It's in our note from the budget. So the protective services. <laughs> See, Patty, you want to put your hand in a cookie jar. <laughs> <laughs> That's you. Sixty-six hundred dollars sitting in a reserve yeah, we forget about for seven the years. Year. Hence why we're having this before our strategic plan, and then we can yeah. think about <laughs> how we might want to re, re. Uh, and yet, yeah, we, we want to do more public engagement on something. We want to do and this and this is there, and then we can't do it. Let's do it. <laughs> Duly heard. Um, protective services. <laughs> protective services. Um, at this point, we would be cautious to use about seven hundred and fifty thousand up to eight hundred thousand of that, while we sort out some things. Um. <laughs> Where would the money come from? I mean, what what causes money to get put into that reserve? I can't speak to its entire history, but I know more recently um, it has been things you know like that. when we had the rent um, adjustment and uh, the lease agreement back and forth with the RCMP building, so that had a recent contribution. We have some things that we put there when we have disputes on our billings, um, so we have pushed some funds there in case those don't happen the way we want, um, but there probably is just under a million dollars there, probably $900,000 there that we could start to repurpose out into the capital programming for a protective service nature and maybe to Councillor um, Chappelle's comments, maybe you want to consider some of your emergency service areas here. Um, same rules apply as our other designated surplus, so there was a strategy to buy positions, but I'm a little uncomfortable with those things, and we'll talk about that shortly under the best practices section. Uh, tax appeals very quickly. Uh, we have a couple of major appeals underway, so we put a provision away in case the revenue that we thought we had doesn't pan out for us, and we have to pay that back um, through an appeal process, so we, we put a provision up so that uh, the taxpayer isn't hit with that later, a few years later. Uh, cyclic, cyclic expenditures, we, anything that we have, so elections, uh, GIS aerial photos, bargaining uh, over three years, OCP, 
Uh, those four things we actually put a little bit away every year because we know those are going to come up over and over and over again. That's the cyclic reserve or the cyclic expenditure provision. Uh, grant revenues, I need to investigate this. This looks like it was probably a, a accounting issue at some point. So it probably needs to be in my deferred revenue instead of here. Um, so just bear with us on that while we fix that. Uh, the accounting standards changed, and I think somewhere between all of our ch staff changes in the interim, this one ended up in a provision and probably should be somewhere else. And the other minor provisions, they're things like we get donations for animal control, or yes, specifically for our um, shelter or for emergency services where they've fundraised for us specifically, we hold those because they were, you know, the community did, did something and for a specific purpose, so we're holding a couple of those things, okay? Uh, working capital, this is the, the accumulated surplus number, the magic, uh, the one that you're allowed to put your hands in the cookie jar. <laughs> for any old reason you want. Um, Having said that, the general fund, um, so we had said earlier that our target was one eighth of operating expenditure. So I've got two different numbers here. Is it operating, um, is it the operating expense, because it said expense actually in the policy. So is it operating expense um, with or without amortization? So without amortization, you need about $5.2 million here to meet your targets. And with amortization, you need about $6 million. Uh, we're currently holding about $8 million. Uh, key offenders here are the sewer, they're over their surplus, and then general fund is um, about is over its um, kind of targeted requirement. I kind of scratch my head as to where the one-eighth came from, so, um, okay. <laughs> it's in our guiding principles and policies, but that's the target that it's given, is the one-eighth operating. Are there other municipal sort of guidelines, or is that just... I'll go out and do some more work. This is an area that, frankly, I don't know that there's a lot of... I've gone to reserve courses and accumulated surplus. They didn't really... I mean, basically, they want you to life cycle things out and make sure you have enough reserves and, you know... I don't, I don't know where that magic rule of thumb is for this. Um, we can certainly research it more. To give you a rough idea, you're, you're, you're doing okay in working capital. You have enough. Uh, we, could, we can continue to use a little bit. Uh, we don't keep our future, like we, this is net of our, what we need to use next year, so we have some room there. Um, the figure for the general fund is probably sitting a little bit, I, I have to put a bit of a caveat around it. We are doing some, some cleanup right now around some of our accounting processes with surplus. Um, and specifically right now we are doing some interim financing, about $2.6 million worth of interim financing from there. So that will, once we go to borrowing, that will lift this up a little bit more. Um, we also, um, I need to work out something with the intercompany issue with the um, SODC lands and that corporation, that formally known as SODC corporation, we need to just make sure, I think there might have been an entry not working. So when the consolidated, we know the answer, but in, when I'm actually looking at my surpluses, they're negatively impacted right now by something they shouldn't be. So I need to go back and figure out why that's happening. So bear with us, but this is what I believe our accumulated surplus to be today that's open and available. Okay. Are we on? Is this the last slide? Uh, using accumulated surplus? <laughs> golden rules? I think we've that's said them enough. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So. So this is the discussion actually I was hoping to have and, and I'm cognizant of the time, but um, so maybe we can kind of set it up for another mm -hmm. discussion. But, but this is the one that uh, when the number six million in accumulated surplus came up during our budget discussions, I was quite surprised. And then we had kind of a, an offline discussion about it's used for interim financing between you know January 1st so the tax revenue comes in June 30th, et cetera, instead of going out for borrowing and working capital requirements, and so I can understand all of that. I get, it's sort of a fascination for me, because having gone through these budget processes and you're banging your head trying to figure out whether you're going to have something or not have something, and all of a sudden this little angel flies into the room with a bag of money and it's coming from accumulated surplus, and it solves our problems, you know. And you think, well, what did that do? So, so I get the point of using it to reduce the level of taxation, which is just artificial, because eventually you'll have to come up there. Um, but on the other hand, um, for me, it, I guess there's a danger in having too much money there. And, and you know, in a business, if we were making widgets and that was profit, we just hadn't distributed to shareholders or something, not a problem. 
But it's money we've taxed, if I understand it correctly, uh, and we've taken it from people. And so um, I understand there's a need to retain some of it, but otherwise, we should put it to use. Uh, and so I think that's the discussion, uh, and it won't happen this afternoon, uh, around what we do with it. And, and if we did nothing else but just not borrow that amount of money in the next budget, uh, in effect it's going for some infrastructure or something, uh, then, um, then maybe that's a better thing for it after you get past a certain point. So that's kind of the thing that I wanted to have a discussion around. And now having gone through some of those other designated surpluses, um, maybe there's some designation or redesignation of some of those we should look at as well. It's maybe a bigger discussion, uh, seeing that there's some possibly dead money in there as well that you know could be used for some community benefit. So two sorry. very quick slides, and it might partially address. Yeah, because my question is, um, how much working capital do we need, and is the very fact that we're using it for working capital actually a, a good use because it avoids interest? So it's a good use of the tax dollars, right? Okay. So the golden rules are exactly that. Try not to use year-over-year money unless you're phasing in to stabilize rates. So we have done that before with the protective services. When we knew we were going from you know, a big hit all of a sudden in one year, we try to phase that in. So that's a good use of it. Good use of it is to use it for one-time projects. <coughs> um, caveat on that, under this one is why not apply to special projects? Well, we would. Um, the only thing is that I want to keep you guys cognizant of is the fact that every year we have special projects so that almost is like a year over year operating line to a certain level and I think the magic discussion with council is what is the magic level that we say we're not going below that anymore with accumulated surplus because year over year and so what I did was I just pulled you the last few years I pulled what we actually um, took um, in terms of special projects that were not carry forward projects. So what was the total amount of projects that we spent year over year? The average was 781,000. And what are we funding from taxation on, on average is about 460. Our target was 650, maybe that's too high. So something for council to mull over as we go through in terms of targets for 2018. And I'll, I'll, I know we're under pressure, so I won't expand on that anymore. I think I've broken record on some of those topics. Um, and so, if there's any other takeaways you'd like us to look into more, we're happy to do that. Well, I think it's cleaning up some of those reserves. I think there's probably a discussion around adaptation at some point. Um, but whether that happens through community development or finance and audit, I'm not quite sure where that sits, actually. Probably right. here, realistically. No. No, because we're talking about a lot about infrastructure priorities and all the different plans that we so it fits somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, we can also look at it as we're going through the budget process to finding ways. But again, I don't. What I want to be careful of is that we find an, an establish some level of operating project that we're not funding this way year over year, and some level of capital investment that we're not funding year over year because we are trying to stabilize the tax rate in a longer way. So that's my only caveat to you. Yes, absolutely. When those one-off big things come through, like uh, this last time OCP, we used accumulated surplus. It made sense. It was kind of a big spike of stuff we had to do, and now we've chosen to put that in our cyclic reserve. But, but those are great, great ideas in terms of the municipal hall, stockpiling some capital. I would highly recommend that we move some of the working capital over to your general fund capital reserve. We found that it was underfunded. Maybe we move it over there and we skip investing more than the million dollars this year. We stay at the million dollar level and bring some of that accumulated surplus to just bring that capital back up to a level that we're hitting. So those are some of the things I'd love to toss by and that we, as a management team, would love to look at before we come into the next budget cycle. And very briefly, and I think it, it wouldn't hurt to um, try to develop a little bit of policy. So we take some of the just guesswork and uncertainty out of it. And um, and I agree with you on the recurring special projects. I mean, I, I absolutely get that. That's like the paving budget, the mm -hmm. same idea. It's, we're going to have them. It's got to be a line item. I understand. But it's the kind of the extra stuff that keeps showing up that mm -hmm. allows this fund to accumulate. That my term is dead money, but I mean, just it's money that we tax for and not use. You're not using. Exactly. So um, I'd be hopeful to develop a little bit of policy around that. And if it is just going to community fund. Fine. If that's what we decide to do, that might be the best thing for it, uh, and save us taxing for money for more capital reserve. Yeah. yeah.
that, that's sort of my number. Right now, off the top, that would be my first recommendation to you, is that we look at moving about 2.5 million right over to capital reserves. But that would be my number one thought process around that. And that's not how I've got it. Uh, okay, last thing is a question about the TT. So we're going to put the TTP project, the technology transformation project, on this agenda because it's big and this year there's a lot of work being done in the finance area. And Christina, I think you had a question for council. I do, just a very brief one. We're just grappling right now with setting up some of our workflows. And one of the areas where we have a new position that's come in that's not in our um, bylaw for designating purchasing authority. And it's a senior director position, sorry. <laughs> a senior director position falls somewhere between, is it the director level or the GM level you'd like them to have for purchasing authority? It's kind of unclear for us and we're trying to do the workflows. So we need to decide are they director or GM status in terms of purchasing authority. So that's just one of the questions for us to resolve for workflow. And the reason we put the standing item on the TTP project is literally just for these kind of emerging things as we're going through the project, we need to get a business process sorted so that we can build the system. And we'll have to bring back, maybe we need to bring back the bylaw for more clarity. Okay. This side we need something in front of us. Okay. okay. What would you prefer? What what makes sense? To, I would like to hear what makes sense to staff as far as if, if it's a concern. Else. If it's a concern for council, they want to deliberate and think about it more. Then we can bring back a bylaw. And then we can I think just see the level of delegation for that. Because then yeah. it's on paper, and we can make a good decision. Okay. Right. Okay. okay. Yeah. I mean, on that, if we're going to have TTP on this committee, and if there is sort of a request like that, a little memo, just sort of having it in writing in the agenda is helpful. You could make a decision right away, but there's nothing in front of us. Yeah, no, that's a fair comment. In front of us. Okay. Right. Okay. Uh, there's nothing under item five in terms of recommendations or referral to council. I captured a whole bunch of notes about things we might want to talk about in our strategic planning session. Um, and anybody that has any feedback, let me know. Uh, motion to terminate. Moved by Peter, seconded by Patty. All those in favor? All those in favor. Thanks very much.